So welcome to video three. And in this, we're going to show you how to use songs to introduce the oral and then the written aspects of rhythm. And I have to admit, I'm pretty excited about this video myself. I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but in tutor books, they tend to introduce rhythm as individual units. We get semi-briefs worth four beats, and then we get minims worth two beats. Well, in this, we're going to be showing just the opposite. We're always going to introduce rhythm in a musical context. That's within the frame of a beat, basically. And here, the focus is on the relationship between each of the individual units, how they fit within a pulse, an ongoing sense of movement. That's called the rhythm of the words. 
Can we all make our fingers tap the rhythm of the words? Say the words and let your fingers tap. Get ready. Are you ready, Leia? Are we ready? Off you go. So all the songs and the chants that we've done up till now have been preparation for the concept of pulse or can be used as preparation for the concept of pulse. It doesn't need to be made conscious to the children until the time is right. But of course it's going on all the time. So in the clip I now present pulse as a musical concept. Notice that my teaching here is very direct. I'm telling the children, I'm not asking them to extract things that they don't already know. But I explain that music has a pulse or a beat and that the pulse is felt rather than heard. And just notice the motion that I make with the heel of my hand on my chest. Why do you think I'm explaining that this is the pulse? So of course, if I put my hand on my chest and just make a small movement, it's a, it's a silent motion. 
So I think this helps the children to understand this idea of feeling the pulse. But then I explain about the beat and how the beat can be heard. And so we all sing the song again whilst we tap the beat. And I think the, the important thing to feel here is, or the important uh, point to make here, is that the skill is to feel the onward sense of the pulse. The pulse doesn't stop. It just keeps moving on and on and on. So we've already introduced pulse. The children have experienced keeping a steady pulse. Hopefully they've moved to a pulse as well. That's a really important point. And now we introduce the concept, the musical concept of rhythm for the very first time. And notice how I extract the rhythm pattern of the words. And this is the phrase that I use with the children. I call it the rhythm pattern of the words. And we say the words rather than singing it because it takes out any confusion at all with the pitch. To keep it really accurate, I just encourage the children to tap the fingers lightly together. It needs lots and lots of practice in subsequent sessions and particularly making sure that they're quite independent when they're doing this. So really this is just the start. And as you'll see as we go on through the subsequent videos, we can show you a few more uh, ideas for this. But the ideas are go on forever and ever. And I would encourage you to be, as you watch this again, just be creative. What else could I do with this? Off I go, I go, chicka, 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 ha, la, chicka, la, chicka, la, ha. That's called the rhythm of the words. Can we all make our fingers tap the rhythm of the words? Say the words and let your fingers tap. Get ready. Are you ready, Leia? Are we ready? Off you go. Hi. Instruments have a magic effect on children, and I think you'll see that coming up here. Um, they want to play, and in fact, we know that children regard playing instruments as being a musician, whereas they don't necessarily regard singing as being a musician. And so there, there is this immediate effect. And you, you might notice in the, in the video as a whole, the difference between when we're just tapping the pulse or tapping the rhythm, and there's a slight amount of fidgeting going on there. And this next bit where the instruments come in and suddenly everything calms down. There's no need to be scared though of using instruments with a group of children. It's all a question of making your expectations about behaviour really explicit. If you're really explicit, they know how to behave, they will do exactly what you want to and there will be no noise. Just watch what I do here. So the rule with the instruments is, I will put the instrument in front of you but you don't pick the instrument up until I ask you to. Okay. The instrument goes on the floor, and your hands stay in your lap. And at the end of the song, the instrument goes back on the floor, and your hands go back in your lap. Otherwise, we just end up with the noise that isn't music at all. So, let's see what have I got here. I have got a frog. Here we go. One frog. The instrument stays there. Excellent. Let's see if everybody else can do just the same. And we've got the edge. And we've got pets. And we've got a duck. <laughs> and we've also got another egg shaker. I love you. You're very clever at doing that, folks. So we're going to pick our instruments up in a moment when I say the magic word. And the magic word is rhythm. What's the magic word? Rhythm. When I say the magic word again, you will pick your instruments up and you'll hold it ready. Beat. I show them how they should sit and just look at how Emma copies me exactly right down to the hands being in her lap and then when I give the instruments out did you notice how controlled I was I gave each one out individually and I praised them when the behavior was what I wanted them to be which they all were so now onto the magic word and and this is a little trick I've picked up 
Um, the magic word gives the signal to pick up the instruments and it just gets them listening and gets them quiet. Um, of course, you can use it for any activity, not just picking up instruments. And the word itself can, map, can change to match the concept being learned. So what's really interesting also is the way the children pick up the instruments. It's a very quick, sharp movement. And I think you'll see subsequently that that movement is maintained even in some of the other videos. So what I would say finally about playing with instruments is that once you've created these rules, stick to them. Be consistent. Don't go changing the goalposts because that's when the children will get confused and they will then start to what you will perceive as breaking the rules. If the children are noisy with instruments, it's because you haven't made the rules clear enough. So have some rules, stick to them and be consistent. So we've been feeling the pulse, feeling the pulse, which is our heart. And when I put it on an instrument, we call it the beat. So if I do the song again, Yeah. And what about 
Section. This is the next stage of the learning process where we're beginning to move from the sense of pulse and the rhythm of the words and making rhythm a little more conscious for all our pupils. And you'll see now with all the children that I've got some hearts there on the floor and these are a visual aid to help make the point of the pulse and the fullness of many of the songs that we're doing at the moment. And I also explain the difference between the pulse and the rhythm. And I show that by using those hearts as that visual aid. Just watch how I bring all that together in this next clip. You can see I've got some heartbeats here. So have a look at this bit and I make them curious by asking a question. Yeah. <laughs> See if you can work out what, what they're going to do. 
of my roses. Hang on a minute, let's do it one more time. Keep those sticks on the floor until you get the handy word. Off I go. I go to the low. So the question was, what happens? What happens there? And I've given them visual cues and oral cues to help them solve that mystery. What happens? What happens the fact that I have one sound on one of the heartbeats, but I then have two sounds on other heartbeats? And we piece together the, uh, the bits of the jigsaw, let's say but I don't give them all the answers. I'm helping them, I'm leading them towards finding the solution to the mystery. What's missing here though really is a physical response. Lots and lots of other things that we could have done. See if you can just think about what, what other ways could we have worked to reinforce the beat and to emphasize the rhythm. I often like to get my kids walking the beat um, and because of the limitations we weren't able to do this but it's something that you could do in subsequent lessons. Can they walk the beat? Can they walk the beat and tap the rhythm? Here's one. How about walking the rhythm and tapping the beat? How about using chairs or children to represent the beats? So for example you could have four chairs each one representing the beat and then you can make up a tar and a tete rhythm. One child means a tar, and two children on a chair mean a tete. Can they compose rhythms? And this is where groups are so wonderful, because you could use a group and they could compose a rhythm, and then the other children could read that rhythm, or vice versa. The, again, the possibilities for this are endless. It's just up to you to be a creative teacher. Go away and have some fun with that one. So we've had pulse, we've had the rhythm pattern of the words. Watch this clip and see how I introduce the next stage. And have a listen to what I do now. Ta, 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 ta. So I've just introduced them to the rhythm language, the tars and the tetes, and look how simply I did that. It's something completely new. So again, I have to teach them in a direct way. There's no point in asking them to guess because they don't know. Having introduced it though, watch how we do lots and lots of practice on this. And I do it in several different ways. And again, we're limited by the size of this video clip but this should continue over the following weeks, in fact forever. You can continue to play all sorts of wonderful games with rhythms and rhythm language. We finish by playing Simon Says, and this was quite fun, and it just happened. It was one of those, you know, an idea popped into my head, so yes, okay, I think we'll try that. Um, think about how I could have extended that even further, because it definitely perks us all up and keeps everyone on the ball. Now, Emma, I'd like you to listen, and I'd like you to tap the rhythm back. So a little bit like this.
Sally introduced rhythm language and playing games within a group setting and what you've just seen me doing is playing a rhythm game with Emma in a one-to-one -one piano lesson. So I've got this simple ostinato in my left hand and then I improvise a simple one bar rhythm in 4-4 which Emma taps back and then eventually analyzes. So what I want you to notice is the way I do this because I've got three very deliberate stages simply because it would be absurd to expect Emma to tap back and work out the rhythm language without first having taken that baby step, which is to simply tap back the rhythm. So watch the first stage of this process where Emma simply imitates the rhythm by tapping it back to me on claves. <laughs> Stage number two is where I add another element and where Emma imitates by both tapping the rhythm and saying it. Have a look. And then in the final stage, stage three, this is where Emma isn't just imitating, she's also analyzing. So have a look at this clip. Notice how Emma, she now, she's not just tapping it and saying it, she's got to work out what to say for the rhythm language. <laughs> Now this is a really neat little activity that you can build into your piano lessons on a really regular basis. So, you know, set the timer for two minutes in every lesson or every other lesson and grow and develop this. And you'll find that this way pupils won't struggle to identify the time values that they get to do in oral tests. You know, the one where the examiner plays, they've got to describe the rhythm. I mean, seriously, this is a great activity for developing that skill. So what exactly am I doing at the piano? Well, what you can do is you can pick a triad. It can be major or minor. Use the open fifth in the left hand and then take a single note from the triad in the right hand to play a rhythm. And you'll probably have noticed that what I've done with Emma in this lesson is I've just limited to crotchets and quavers. The other thing I've done is I've played the left hand and right hand pretty far apart because it's a way of helping the pupil to hear the ostinato bass line, which is obviously supporting the, uh, the, the ongoing pulse, 
and distinguish it from what the right hand does because of course it's the right hand part that the pupil needs to listen for. Now if I'd improvised a melody as opposed to just one pitch that would have added yet another layer of difficulty so the fact that my right hand plays a rhythm on a single pitch is very deliberate. Now I do have pretty expressive facial and eye movements and I'm sure you have noticed that by now. It's something I do unconsciously, it's, it's just who I am. And to be honest, I've cringed to see some of the wild exaggerated expressions that I've used in this video series. But what I now would like to invite you to notice is how I use my eyes, almost as a cue for Emma. So I kind of, I widen them to let her know it's time for her to come in. Have a look at this clip and just see what I mean. Thank you. 